And now, a segment from the best of The Night Side with Barb DiGiulio podcast. Listen and download the latest podcast at Newstalk1010.com. I have a very special guest this hour. Dr. Stephen Mulholland is one of Canada's leading cosmetic plastic surgeons, and he works here in Toronto at Spa Medica. He is here for the hour. I'm going to ask him about all kinds of things. What's happening in plastic surgery? What is trending? Popular procedures for men and women. But the phone lines are open for your questions at 416-872-1010, star talk, star 8255. You can text us at 71010. Dr. Mulholland, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Barb. I'm excited to uh, speak to real live listeners. Yes, yes. <laughs> I promise they are real and they're live. And it was funny because I, I thanked you in the break for coming down here. And uh, you said you were injecting until 15 minutes ago. Until 15 minutes ago, yeah. Cosmetic medicine, self-enhancement, self-empowerment has never been never been more popular. You said you just wiped the blood off and came right down. Well, I think I dabbed I dabbed secretions and came right down, <laughs> yes. Is there, um, is there uh, so in injections, so you're talking about the stuff that people are using to fill in lines? Correct. So if you look at, um, you know, what are the most popular things that, say, women, which is 92% of the market in most instances will do, most women are a little reluctant to engage immediately in surgery, so they engage at uh, a much younger age than they used to in more advanced versions of skin care, like, say, peels and medical skin care and prescriptive products you put on your skin to make a difference. But then uh, needle-based therapy like Botox, which relaxes unfavorable muscles that you might determine don't project what you want to look like, or soft tissue fillers that uh, are safe sugar gels that fill out lines and wrinkles that, again, don't project what you want to project. And, you know, you can look five, seven, eight years younger for the rest of your life and never have a scalpel-based procedure. Nowadays. Really? So I was going to ask you, is is that sort of a, a stepping stone to surgery? But maybe some people are going throughout without ever having to get cut. Yeah, Botox has sort of been commonly known as sort of the gateway treatment, you know, to more advanced uh, addictions and beauty. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a it, good way to put it. it. Many, many, many women just exist uh, just doing non-surgical things. Now, you add to that, let's say, uh, in your 20s, you start with sun avoidance and, and skin uh, UV light protection and all the things we didn't do. I didn't do in the 60s because we had an ozone. There's no ozone anymore, so you got to protect your skin. And then in your 30s, you had uh, more medical chemical peels, uh, taking down your, your rough epidermis, and you may do some light and energy-based treatments like lasers that take away sunspots and blood vessels, and you maintain your pores, and, uh, and, and, and you're doing laser hair removal so you never have to shave, and then you're adding fat destruction technologies like cool sculpting or ultra shape or some of these cool things that are out there now to sculpt your body where exercise and, and diet uh, ends uh, and you enter your 40s and now you're starting to see the signs of aging and you maybe start uh, adding volume to your face and a little Botox relaxation. Don't let it get out of control. You want to still look like you belong to Homo sapiens, that genus and phylum. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Uh, you don't want to be, and I don't mean to be mean, she's a beautiful woman, but Nicole Kidman, I mean, really, there's no, there's there's no mm -hmm. movement in her face, there right? There really isn't. But, you know, when you're that beautiful, maybe you don't need it. Maybe. You know? And she's not that great an actor, so she shouldn't <laughs> maybe speak that way. So. Maybe. And maybe she's not a homo sapien. I mean, we don't know all, all the answers. I have someone who has been waiting on the line patiently to talk to, doc, to, to, talk to Dr. Stephen Mulholland. Kelly, go ahead. You're on the night side. Welcome. Hi, Barb. Hi. Dr. Mulholland. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, I've been researching um, having the surgery done to reduce the bags under my eyes. Mm -hmm. I've had many things over the years. I've had cancer twice, a ruptured brain aneurysm. Many things have happened. So it's aged me really prematurely, and I'm not happy with the way it looks. What I am concerned about is the downtime afterwards. I've read many different things, and I have a very busy job. I'm a facility manager for three buildings. So it's not like I can relax for a long time afterwards. You know, and I was wondering what, what the downtime was. What a great question, because sometimes for people, it's not the procedure, but they don't want anyone at work to know. So they want to make sure they're healed and whatever by the time they go back. How old are you, Kelly? I'm 47. Okay. So 47 often in, in the 40s, it's, it's, we age around the eyes. 
uh, we haven't yet descended. Our jowls are still usually tucked up nicely uh, in our <laughs> mid face. And, and so it's usually ab about the eyes. And you're absolutely right. You know, you can hide body work, breast surgery, tummy surgery, but you can't hide face surgery. And so bags under the eyes, you can sometimes start with non-surgical options. So you have this size of a, let's say, a kidney bean fat pad that's sticking out and, and, and you've got some, some veins that make your eye look a bit dark and, and things look a bit sunken. Often a soft tissue filler, a little light laser done on a Friday afternoon can get you back to work on a Monday looking significantly more rested. And of course that projects a vibrant, engaged employee that's making the right decisions. So sometimes it's a professional decision. So you might start with consultations on non-surgical options, but let's say you decide, nope, I wanna do something permanent. I wanna tighten my skin. I want to remove the fat pad and I want it to last for years. That's called a lower lid blepharoplasty. And often the approach is inside the eyelid and that yicky pink looking stuff when you pull your eyelid down. Hey. And then working on the skin from the outside. And it's usually the skin work on the outside if you have wrinkles or crepiness. It's either going to be a laser or a little uh, skin removal. And you're going to have some bruising. And that bruising is going to mean seven days off. So if you time this for a Thursday or a Friday and you book in the two weekends, you'll miss five days of work. And there's really almost no other way around it unless you're going to celebrate it with your coworkers. You're going to want to go back uh, looking reasonably uh, well healed. And, and then it's going to be some green mat, a little uh, powder foundation to hide the subtle bruising when you do go back. So I wish there were no downtime, but looking your best often requires uh, dedication. And you've been through a lot of stress, it sounds like, medical and otherwise. So you probably have made things... Um, under your eye look a little worse uh, just uh, just by having to survive what you have survived. So you have to take five more days out of your life that are working days and, and commit to lower lid rejuvenation. And um, bending over, would I be okay to be doing that following? I wasn't really worried about how it looks coming back because I really don't care. It's oh. all about me. But I was worried about the bending over and and working, you know, strenuously. That's, that's a good, that qu effective? good question. You know, in the first in the first three or four days, there are some um, delicate blood vessels that are sealed, and if you bend over and strain, it raises uh, the blood pressure around your eyes, and it could cause some bleeding. But in general, as long as you're not. Uh, you know, you're not a, a world-class bodybuilder and le deadlifting 180 pounds. You can carry office base boxes around and within a few days quite easily. And what would uh, the approximate cost be of something like that? And, you know, there's a range in the city and, and in the country, but in general... Uh, two lids, whether it's two upper lids or two lower lids, it's going to start at about $2,500 and might go as high as $6,000 depending on um, how aged that lower lid is and the practice in the city. Uh, but you have $2,500 uh, for two lids and often, uh, let's say you do the upper and lower lid combination, it's called a quad bleph or four lid blepharoplasty. That's usually in the $4,000 to $8,000 range, depending on the practice in the city. All right. We are with Dr. Stephen Mulholland, cosmetic plastic surgery at Spa Medica. Like a surgeon. The Night Side with Barb DiGiulio on In-Depth Radio, News Talk 1010. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Is that Weird Al? Yes, of course, it had to be. Welcome back to the show. Dr. Stephen Mulholland is my guest. He is one of Canada's leading cosmetic plastic surgeons. He is at Spa Medica, and that is, uh, that's in Yorkville. Yeah, it's right on Avenue Road in Yorkville, um, just uh, Avenue Road in Bloor area, just across from the old Four Seasons. And again, thank you for spending uh, your Friday night with us, because I know it's a very, very busy um, practice you've got going. Well, I love uh, cosmetic plastic surgery. I love talking about it, and so um, I love sharing it. We've got a couple callers lined up, but on behalf of Dr. Mulholland, we want some men to call because men are starting to really get into it and probably afraid to admit it as much as women. It's no question. When I opened uh, my surgery center in 1996, 97, that entire year, I saw two men and one wasn't heterosexual. So I saw one heterosexual man the whole year. Uh, now men are 20% of the business. And for some procedures, such as laser hair removal, they can be as, you know, as high as 30, 40%. And hair transplantation has taken off because we use these 
cool little robots now and it's artists and this neograft and there's no cutting no scalpels and really of course, oh yeah and men are extremely vain we just don't admit it yes and uh, we're very intensely intimate about our hair and view that everybody um, views you as uh, as uh, as a section uh, secondary sexual trait as your your hair and your hair style i didn't mean to be so enthusiastic with my yes when you said <laughs> men are so vain i just that just kind of came out 416-872-1010 star talk star 8255 text us at 71010 back to the questions we've got karen on the line hi karen welcome to the night side you're with dr mulholland hi there great show thank you um my question is uh, for people of color, because of the way scarring is on our skin, are there any? Are there usually any scars that are seen after any kind of plastic surgery for people of color? Well, so you know, people of color. Uh, I would also include Caucasians because they're white, um, which is, I guess, a shade, not a color. And uh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm always concerned about scars. And but you know, I'm I'm married to a woman who's very dark, like skin type five, which is you know, a very dark color and, um, and dark skin individuals are prone to pigmentation disorders, brown discoloration and scars that are usually much darker than their surrounding skin. And so you're absolutely right. Whether it's breast augmentation or it's a facelift or it's liposuction or a tummy tuck, thing need, things need to be hidden extremely well. Uh, when you have darker skin that you know is not going to heal favorably. And with Caucasian skin, it's often prone to then scars that are red and raised and equally unattractive. And so attention to placement is one of the tricks of plastic surgery school. And so whatever procedure you would be considering, just remember for the past, you know, almost 100 years, uh, it's been performed, and for women of color, it's always sitting down and deciding what procedure, what approach, what incision is going to be the best. What Great. is? Thanks for your call, Karen. And what is uh, uh, the process somebody goes through if they want to do a consultation with you? You know, usually it should start now online. Go online, uh, do web-based searches, Google what procedure I want, t uh, Toronto, and then look up uh, practices that are you know, highly ranked because they're usually going to be popular. Uh, Google doesn't rank you high if you're not popular. And you're usually popular if you're good because there's no way to trip Google. So it's really just go ask <laughs> Google who to see and then pick three practices. Uh, and then go online and look on websites like uh, Real Self or, or um, you know, City Search and Yelp and see what people are saying about the, these uh, physicians and practices. Go on websites like the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and make sure there's no complaints and then the physician's good in good standing. And then go and interview the doctor. As much as you're going to have a, um, a history and physical, you want to ask certain questions. How long you've been in practice? How many of these have you done? What complications have happened? You know, what if complication happens to me? How is it managed? Make sure there's good before and afters. Make sure you can talk to patients. And then at the end of the day, you just got to feel right, uh, a good sense and that this is the right physician and team for you. Okay, we'll go back to the phones. We asked for men to call. We've got some men on the line. We'll go to Frank. Hi, Frank. You're on with Dr. Stephen Mulholland. Welcome. Hi, Barb. Hi, Doc. Thanks for, thanks for taking my call. So, I've got a question for you, Doc. <laughs> uh, when I was growing up, I had what I thought were like a lot of blackheads on my nose. Mm -hmm. Upon, you know, when you look at them closer, you realize they weren't your typical, like, blackhead. It was more like a little hair follicle coming out of the pore. Mm -hmm. Is that still considered a blackhead, or is it something else? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. First of all, your first mistake was growing up. The, yeah, and well, then yeah. what, once we arrive at an age of, let's say, adolescence, all kinds of things happen to guys' skin. <laughs> yeah. Testosterone uh, leads to usually larger pores. The pores can get blocked. And right. you could get a typical blackhead, which is a, a plug. Uh, and there's, there's ways other than squeezing to actually extract these plugs so you don't make the pores worse. Some pores, especially on the nasal base or that partition at the base of your nose, we get the, or, or your ear cartilage, we get these creepy appendage hairs, like guy hairs coming out of the nose. Right. And in that, those circumstances, back when you were growing up, uh, I presume there was no laser hair removal until the late 90s. But now, 
uh, we can certainly remove those um, those hair shafts that uh, that are in those uh, uh, pores with laser hair removal permanently. And so, so they never come back. They, my son has the same thing. Yeah. He's twenty, and you could notice them now, like at five feet. Yeah, we have really good permanent reduction laser hair removal devices now where, you know, four or five treatments, you capture all the uh, hair shafts and growing cycles, and uh, the hair will never grow again. Now, of course, that eliminates all the women that have a fascination for nasal hair with him, so you you want to make sure it's the right thing. One one quick question, Doc. Mm -hmm. When you have that, then you obviously know that most people will try to pop them, right? Yes. Now, what can you do about one pockmark that's centrally placed on a nose <laughs> that's like everybody, you know, your eyes go there automatically. Mm. Yeah, so if, for that sebaceous type of skin where it's oily and there's large yeah. pores and then you've got induced scarring usually yeah. from being a picker. Right. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of solutions up until, let's say, the last seven, eight years. Now we've got some really cool things called fractional lasers and these fractional lasers um, can resurface uh, nasal skin and improve the appearance of the pore. Uh, we've got these great devices that can um, that can actually change the texture of the skin. So there is hope to never, you, you can never get rid of 100%, but certainly 50, 60, 70% improvement in that sort of acneiform scarred nasal skin or uh, or, or picker-based nasal skin is certainly doable. So it's you don't have to have a Carl Malden skin for the rest of your life. <laughs> Frank, thanks a lot for the call. And we have to take another break, but Mandy, Aiden, Albert, Norma, stay on the line. And if you would like to ask a question of Dr. Stephen Mulholland, it's 416-872-1010, star talk, star 8255, text us at 71010. He is one of Canada's leading cosmetic plastic surgeons, and he is here with us tonight on The Night Side. <laughs> The Night Side continues with Barb DiGiulio on News Talk 1010. Welcome back to the show. My guest this hour is cosmetic plastic surgeon, Dr. Stephen Mulholland. His uh, place of work is Spa Medica. He is one of the leading cosmetic plastic surgeons in Canada. Just mentioning that uh, 40 weekends a year, you go and teach what you do. You travel all over. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very fortunate in that in Canada, we often have access to drugs, products, and devices before they might get approved in the United States. And so uh, I usually have a lot of experience with something when it is FDA cleared. And so I work with um, a number of different companies to help doctors learn the art of aesthetic medicine, because really is an art. And a lot of physicians in the U.S. are, um, you know, frankly, quite shocked at the... Um, the healthcare system and, and the managed care system under Obama, and they're looking for additional sources of income. And I usually tell them it's just a bad idea to go into this if you think it's about money. You've got to feel passionate about what you're doing. And uh, But there's no shortage of fun to be had. What makes you passionate about this kind of work? Well, it's quite transformative. Uh, and, uh, you know, human nature, unfortunately, is such that we live in, in, in a beauty culture. And so when you put something on that looks good, when you, your hair just looks right, or when your skin looks glowy and you feel more confident, you have that surge of serotonin, and it's un, good or bad, right or wrong, it is a high. So I help people get high naturally, looking <laughs> their best. So they don't need cannabis, they just need Botox. 416-872-1010, star talk, star 8255, text us at 71010. Hi, Mandy, welcome to the Night Side with Dr. Mulholland. Hi, Barb. Hi, Stephen. How are you? Good, Very thanks. Good. Thank you, Mandy. Good topic. Um, I have a question. My husband just recently lost 20 pounds. He's not obese or really overweight or anything, but he has a bit of a belly. He always has, even when he was thinner. And he wants to go through liposuction. So a couple of questions. Uh, complications, how long would he be out of work? Uh, and is it true when you go through liposuction, like your fat, if you were to gain it back, redistributes on the body in awkward places? Those are, those are both great questions. And um, first of all, you need to do the guy test. What's uh, that? The, the guy, you know, yeah. when you look at a guy and he's got the big beer belly yeah. and you think, oh, he would do well with lipo. But quite often we men accumulate fat internally called the dangerous fat, oh. the fat that bathes our organs and causes us heart disease and heart attacks. And so you have to poke him in the belly a few times and okay. see if it's as hard as rock. And if it's internal fat, then we can't help him. But if he's standing there, I'm not talking sitting down, but standing there and you can grab fat and you can hang on onto it with your hands, 
uh, then that's that's amenable to liposuction, and and that includes the love handles at the side. And so, if you look what men do, the number one thing men do is hair transplantation. The number two thing is liposuction. The number one area for men is the midsection, the Molson muscle, or if they're American, it would be the Budweiser muscle, <laughs> and that usually extends just above the belly button down to the belt loop and comes around the sides. And then what you can grab onto would be the love handles. And so, liposuction has changed tremendously. So what are the risks now? Far less than they used to be. Number one, you don't have to go to sleep. It can often be done under local anesthesia. Uh Um, We use little devices to go in before removing, and we melt the fat, lasers called smart lipo, and electrical current devices called body tight, and even ultrasound waves called vaser lipo, and we liquefy the fat. So we take your man's belly, and we turn it into like a mango smoothie, (laughs) and then it's much easier to remove that fat because you don't have to remove it. Like if you you watch Nip Tuck or those shows like Extreme Makeover It comes out in chunks. Yeah, it doesn't anymore. It comes (laughs) out very, very smooth, (laughs) not to be consumed, but very smooth. And then um, and then there's much less bruising and pain than there used to be. So even guys who are notoriously wimpy, as a, as I'm saying, as a genre where wimpy, can tolerate it and can be back to work quite soon. So first of all, make sure it's the right fat, fat under the skin. Number two, uh, the complications include things like, um, you know, irregularities and uh, uh, lumps and indentations. So it's not so much about uh, the technique, but the surgeon doing the technique. Uh, and then certainly the, then the, the recovery. The recovery, uh, usually most guys can be back to work in three days if it's sedentary, about a week if they're quite active. And then you know, your last question was a good one, is um, in, in, in this scenario, weight maintenance is very important. You know, I usually tell most patients this is not a weight loss technique, it's a body contouring technique. So mm. you should be at the ideal weight that you think you can live at. It may not be the ideal weight for your medical Um, insurance uh, forms, but stay at that weight because if you gain 10 pounds or more, it's going to go to areas you don't want it. It never goes where you need it. And a woman puts on weight, doesn't go to her high cheekbones or her breasts. Mm -hmm. It goes to the arm. (laughs) It goes to your inner thighs so they stick (laughs) together. It just never does the right thing. And so, yes, it can ruin the area that you had liposuction, but even worse can go to areas you don't want it. Dr. Stephen Mulholland is my guest, cosmetic plastic surgeon at Spa Medica. Aiden is next. Hi, Aiden. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. And I promise Mandy is not my wife in this conversation. <laughs> All but right. This is a question kind of both for my wife and I. Um, her through childbirth, you know, a dozen plus years ago, and myself from um, significant weight loss, both have a stretch mark and we're pretty self-conscious about them. So for me, it's kind of hips and thighs, and for her, it's lower stomach, abdomen. I've been told mine could probably be handled through laser, it sounds like hers because there's a lot more excess skin would have to be surgical. And I'm just kind of wondering how evasive are those two things and kind of recovery times and danger. All right. Good question. Stretch marks are ubiquitous, uh, particularly from childbirth and weight loss, weight gain. What color skin would just be light, fair skin, both you guys? Yeah. Yeah, So usually they're going to be white stretch marks that are whiter and shiny and silvery on, on on white skin. And, you know, up until five years ago for guys uh, that weren't getting abdominal plastics or belt lifts, let's say they were weight lifters and they got them in their, in their shoulder area or, they, or, or growth stretch marks, there was really no solution. Um, we don't have a cure, but we have treatments. And you're right, it's usually laser-based or needle-based techniques. There's a cool device called the Innerjet that will shoot superficial de- uh, sp- fillers into the stretch marks. And so basically, we use devices like lasers or energy-based devices, radio frequency devices, to trick your skin under in the stretch mark to make new collagen because normally it's dormant and it's and it's and it's dead. And we get new collagen, which doesn't look as as wrinkly and silvery and shiny, and we can shrink the stretch mark usually by about fifty percent. So, uh, a benchmark would be about fifty percent improvement after a series of treatments. There's no maintenance required after those series of treatments. Generally, the price range for those five treatments would be in the two to three thousand dollar range uh, for a large zone of stretch marks. And uh, that's usually what most guys do. Women, it's usually after babies. It's usually from the belly button down. Uh, and it's usually accompanied by loose skin. And so particularly if they've had a C-section, you already have 30% of a tummy tuck. 
And tummy tucks come in different varieties now. They're not the big nasty things they used to be. You can often do a little mini skin only tummy tuck, remove 30% of your stretch marks, and then submit the rest of the tummy to the same treatments we just talked, talk, talked about for guys, lasers and light energy based systems. Aiden, thanks a lot for your call. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, we've got Mary, Beth, Albert, Rob on the line. Hang on. We will get to your calls. And if you have a call, a question for Dr. Stephen Mulholland, you can reach us at 416-872-1010, Star Talk, Star 8255. Text us at 71010. It's the night side. Welcome back to the show. This hour, my guest is one of Canada's leading cosmetic plastic surgeons, Dr. Stephen Mulholland, and he's agreed to stick around till 915, which is great because we have a lot of people who want to ask questions. And I wanted to ask you about cosmetic surgery on young people. It's the, it's the Kylie Jenner thing, right? We're seeing a lot of stuff happening with teenagers. How young is too young? Well, every, every plastic surgeon would have a different answer to that. But I, I, as a father of six children, you know, it's, it's tough enough to be a teenager and come to terms with your, your sense of self without complicating it with cosmetic surgery and without, you know, succumbing to peer pressure and paradigms of beauty. I mean, it's, it's, it can be quite, um, quite unhealthy. And so I'm a big believer that you should be a voting adult and that you should be at least 19. Uh, and um, and you should have carefully thought these things out, um, and not it shouldn't be a spontaneous decision. Now, having said that, there's always exceptions to the rule. If you're a young woman and you have a a, a, a pathological condition, for example, one's called Pullen syndrome, where you you don't form a breast on one side and you do on the other, and it's really a hereditary congenital abnormality, then that might be. Uh, a, a situation or circumstance where you might consider it. Or you've had trauma and you broke your nose or you, you were born with an extremely large bump and it is uh, way outside the, the spectrum of, of what would be considered um, normal variant. You might consider those extreme circumstances, but I think as a rule, it's a bad idea to mix teenagers and cosmetic surgery. Let's go back to the phones. We've got Beth on the line. Hi, Beth. Go ahead with Dr. Stephen Mulholland. Good evening. Hi. My question is about breast augmentation. I had it done with saline implants 11 years ago. And I'm just wondering, when, if ever, do you need to replace those? And if you do, what kind of symptoms or signs would be that um, maybe they're past their date? Well, that's you- a- that's a good question. There are millions and millions of women, uh, both Canadian and American, that have had breast augmentation. And uh, saline uh, were the only devices we could use throughout the entire 90s until the earlier part of last decade, whereupon these gummy bear cohesive gel implants became available. <laughs> gummy bear. They're called gummy bears because they're like jello. They don't leak. They're not liquid. And, oh, okay. And, but saline, if the, if you're happy with the shape of the breast, if you are, um, if if there are no, if there's no pain or discomfort, if the breasts haven't gotten hard from some sort of capsular contracture or reaction. Uh, and um, and they look great, and they're not rippling, uh, all the things that can happen with saline, then you should just leave them for the rest of your life. They don't need to be removed. Wow. Um, and so why do, why do women get them removed? The top three reasons why saline implants get removed is because one leaks, and there's about a 2% per year risk per breast. So eventually, the little valve may loosen, and you'll wake up one day and you go, oh, what happened to my breast? And it, it, will, <laughs> it will leak. And, and then, of course, you would have them removed and replaced, and you could do saline again. They've been around for 40 years. They're still available. Or some type of cohesive gel implant. The second most common reason is that some women don't like the feel of their uh, saline implants as they get older because you lose normal breast volume, and the saline can feel kind of ripply, or when you bend over, it can look kind of ripply. Uh, and, they, and some women will swap out for a cohesive gel implant. And then the last reason is that uh, your body over time can sometimes react to an implant and harden. And that hard breast can look abnormal and be uncomfortable. And that's called a capsular contracture. So those are the three most common reasons. But if you have none of those and you're happy, just leave them. What are, I would say, maybe top three procedures that men and women are having done these days? So I would divide that answer, well, that question to two. First of all, non-surgical and surgical. Sure, yeah. for, for non-surgical, for men, uh, non-surgical treatments by far, number one would be laser hair removal. Uh, number two, surprisingly for men, is Botox. And the number three thing that uh, men do uh, after uh, for non-surgical treatments um, is um, is uh, microdermabrasion, skin care. Hmm. When you look at women, uh, non-surgical, number one by far is uh, Botox. 
Number two is laser hair removal. And number three, the last five years come out of nowhere is soft tissue fillers, things like Restylane and Juvederm. Surgically, uh, number one for men is liposuction. Number two is hair transplantation. Uh, and number three is going to be uh, like rhinoplasty. Uh, for women, number one surgical is liposuction, just like men. Number two is breast augmentation. And number three is rhinoplasty. So men and women have become through cosmetic surgery, exactly the same. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll believe ask, it when I see well, it. Just ask Bruce Jenner. <laughs> so when it comes to somebody who wants liposuction, which according to you is the most common procedure, a surgical procedure for men and women, aside from that sort of big, hard beer belly person, who else does not qualify for liposuction? Well, that's a good question. So um, in general, uh, right across the board for any cosmetic surgery, uh, someone who has unrealistic expectations um, should, shouldn't should qualify because they'll never be happy. Number two would be those individuals that are doing it for the wrong reason. They just had a divorce or there's a, dis a death in the family and, and they're motivated by, um, by the, the view that somehow liposuction or a facelift or breast augment will elevate them beyond the grief that they're suffering from. Uh, number three would be someone with a you know psychiatric or personality disorder. Uh, and unfortunately, 15% of all plastic surgery patients have body dysmorphic syndrome, so they can never view themselves as being attractive. And it's our obligation as physicians to weed those people out because we're doing them a disservice. And then there's the physical uh, contraindications. Let's say you just can't maintain stable weight, weight loss, weight gain, uh. weight loss, weight gain. Well, to do liposuction, you're doomed to just gain weight back and, and it's probably not a good idea. Or your skin's very, very loose and you're not going to get enough contraction. That would be a contraindication. And then medical conditions. Anyone who has a medical condition that's not managed and controlled, like uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, a history of heart disease, uh, strokes, um, you, you, cosmetic surgery, you know, has risks with it and it, it, it shouldn't be offered to people who have medical conditions that aren't well. Let's go back to the phones. We've got Albert on the line. Hi, Albert. Thanks for waiting. Hey, hey uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I was just wondering, um, I, I got a 54 inch waist mm -hmm. and I think if I could get it down to 40, say, uh, say around 44, if I could take the 10 inches off, it would make my moving around a lot easier and it would help, it would help me in taking more weight off on my own. I was wondering roughly how much would it cost to go through a, a basic procedure of the liposuction and getting everything kind of stitched up and put put the look right. Approximately how much do you weigh, Albert? I weigh I weigh about three hundred pounds. So in general, what most plastic surgeons would say is you should explore weight loss options. I'm, you probably Googled this and looked it up. But for those that haven't, things like um, uh, weight loss programs, uh, like uh, Weight Watchers support groups, uh, well, and and then and then of course. Uh, structural things like uh, gastric manipulation procedures, like uh, sleeves and bands, uh, and then once I'm you not strapping my stomach, doc. No, no, nothing personal. <laughs> Pardon? I'm not. I'm not putting a strap on my stomach. No, I understand uh, that. But what I'm saying is that most doctors are not going to uh, perform liposuction when you're 300 pounds, because then we're not doing it for contouring. We're really doing it. Uh, to facilitate or stimulate weight loss, and there are certain risks such as deep venous thrombosis. And uh, my uh, hope, my hope is, if if I can say one more thing, sure. My hope is that with with if I can take that ten inches off and the weight that comes with it, that'll make it easier for me to move around. And and I do have some some workout DVDs and stuff, but it's tough for me to do some of the exercises because of the weight. Right. And so uh, so I'm I'm hoping that that that's what my hope is that if I I can get that ten inches off with the extra weight. I'll be able to move around a lot easier. I'll be more. I'll be more likely to walk around a lot more, and, and use those workout videos and stuff, and get the weight, the rest of the weight off on my own. Yeah, I think most surgeons would just say, "Look, Albert, there are risks, and uh, you need to go through medical weight loss, disciplined weight loss before surgical weight loss." Is liposuction sort of the last ten pounds type of thing? You, you know, uh, Albert does have a point. Three hundred pounds, Albert, would be probably too extreme a starting point. But I have many patients that have lost some weight and they've stalled because they've lost motivation. And let's say they're 20 pounds overweight, but they have a couple of contour areas, uh, a bulge here, a bulge there that compromises what shirts or pants they might wear. And then as long as the concept is we're not removing this fat for weight, we're shaping your figure, mm. then sometimes, yeah, you'll perform uh, liposuction surgery for contour on a plus size male or plus size female, not for weight loss, but because they just want to get into something and they know they're always going to be 30 pounds overweight, but they just want it to look good in that 
size 16, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's, and that's a good point and a good reminder. It's not weight loss. It's contouring. Sure, exactly okay. right. Okay, great. Uh, we're going to continue on. Dr. Stephen Mulholland has generously agreed to stay until 9.15. We will continue with your questions about uh, any kind of cosmetic plastic surgery or invasive, non-invasive. Rob, Mary, hang on the line. Everyone else, 416-872-1010. Star Talk, star 8255. You can text us at 71010. It's the night side on in-depth radio news talk 1010. Now back to the night side on in-depth radio news talk 1010. Welcome back to the show. Dr. Stephen Mulholland is here. He's going to stick around till 9:15. Cosmetic plastic surgeon at Spa Medica and I have to explain Mark Tang our technical producer producer always finds relevant songs. I don't I've never heard that. Have you heard that plastic <laughs> surgery song before? I don't I, know. I would have so, I was hoping for Smooth Operator by Sade. Oh, it'll happen before yeah. you leave. I know that. <laughs> 416-872-1010. Star Talk, Star 8255. Text us at 71010. Rob, go ahead and thanks for holding. Hi, Rob. Oh, it's me. Uh, three quick interrelated questions. I have sunspots, various parts of my body, from sun tanning over the years, whatever. Uh, but primarily on my face. And uh, the treatment I've been receiving over the last uh, several years is nitrogen. And it scabs up and goes away, and then it comes back, number one. Number two, on the top of my head, I have the same uh, things, and nitrogen is used to uh, treat it by a dermatologist. (laughs) But on top of that, my hair is disappearing. I'm not sure whether the nitrogen is killing it or it's just normal and then the final question there's a place called hair essentials that stops hair loss with uh, herbal things you put on your head i saw on the internet and in fact says they grow hair 90 day guarantee my question is is this nitrogen treatment uh, proper is it proper for the top of my head and and do you know anything about uh, hair essentials. All right, Rob, there's a lot there. Those are good questions. And so those are things that affect men and, and, and women, hair loss, hair thinning, and sun damage. And, and sun damage can lead to skin cancer, which can be fatal. So um, the sunspots you're talking about, the brown spots, uh, liquid nitrogen is, is our curatage and um, electrodesiccation are common dermatologic treatments. The problem is, is that um, is there, they often they, they don't go deep enough and the, the cells that actually form the pigment when you get sun exposure again, they can come back. Number two, it often leaves a white discolored mark where there used to be a brown mark and that cannot be equally as aesthetically uh, displeasing. So in general, um, for for sunspots like that, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of laser-based energy, things like intense pulse light photofacials or picosecond lasers, which can also be used to remove tattoos. And these can remove those sunspots uh, permanently. But more importantly, when you treat the whole scalp or the whole face or the whole forearm, it blends in all the color. So you don't leave these white spots amidst brown sun damage. And so I think removing the brown spots are important because they're unattractive. They can lead to certain skin cancers, and uh, but you should do it in an aesthetically um, meaningful way so your skin actually looks more attractive. Uh, and then the question about hair loss, very, very common. Women also um, uh, suffer from hair loss. So uh, I do a lot of hair transplantation. And most, most women and, and some men will engage at, uh, at the non-surgical treatments. And so you can divide them into light-based treatments, low-level light therapy. You can buy laser combs online and laser caps. And, and they biomodulate and stimulate dormant uh, follicles to grow. You can put yourself on topical creams and foams uh, that are generally increasing the blood flow called vasodilators. And Rogaine and Minoxidil will be the most common one of that. And then there's nutrient shampoos. And they can have medicated... Uh, physician prescribed products that that work, uh, but then there's a whole area of this um, of these um, herbal ingredients, and some of them will actually work. 
uh, and, and could be quite successful. And then there's injection therapy, things like a stem cell therapy, plasma-rich protein. So there's a lot of things you can do to stimulate hair growth. Nothing wrong with trying something with a 90-day money-back guarantee. What usually they rely on if it doesn't work is people don't go to the trouble to get their money back. But certainly try it. I've seen some pretty incredible uh, hair regrowths using non-surgical techniques. And at the end of the day, sometimes you have to resort to hair transplantation. Now, the cool thing is there's no more scars, no more cutting. We take the hair with tiny little rotatory uh, punches that are robotically operated and insert them. So it can look very, very natural. That's amazing. You said it has come a long way because that was a really um, difficult procedure for many years. For many wanted to get it done. It was, and it looked very obvious um, and lots of, you know, just sort of uh, scarring and bleeding. It was not a good thing, but I guess, I mean, it goes to show how important it is for many uh, men. You can look nowadays from Tom Brady to Jude Law, I mean, hair restoration that's done well looks extraordinary. You wouldn't even know it. And you don't have to have the scar at the back of your head anymore. So you don't have to worry about like, you know, Jeremy Priven getting out of the beach in Maui and getting some <laughs> paparazzi snapshot, multiple scars at the back of the scalp. Those days are long gone. Tom Brady had a hair transplant? No, oh, it's well known. Just look online. Oh, do I, th- I don't Google him enough, <laughs> apparently. Well, I was just Googling his wife and that came up. That's all. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay, Mary, go ahead. And thanks for holding so long. You're on the night side with Dr. Mulholland. Hi there. Um, I have a a question about, uh, I had a C-section 23 years ago, and um, every time I gain weight uh, above the C-section is where it all seems to accumulate the fat that I can never get rid of. And I wanted to know about doing um, a tummy tuck uh, to, to tighten everything up and remove that permanently, because I feel like I have this bun still in there all the time. And I wanted to know, would that be considered um, uh, sort of a, uh, is there any OHIP coverage on any of the surgeries that are done, including a tummy tucks? I'm going to hang up because I'm getting uh, running out of battery, but okay. I'd like to listen to the answer. Thanks, Mary. And that's, uh, Mary's question is <clears throat> very common, very common. You have a C-section, you have this beautiful child that you raise, and every time you look in the mirror, you're reminded of that C-section because you get the dreaded muffin top that hangs over top of it. And if you put on a little weight, it's in the lower tummy, but that C-section scars is attached right down to your muscle and there's no give. And so the fat accumulates over it. And so it's a very, very common motivation for women to do some type of tummy procedure. But tummy tuck's a common term uh, that's thrown around for really three or four different procedures. You can do a little bit of lipo above the C-section scar and reduce the fat and make it flat. That will work in some cases. If you have a little bit of loose skin or the muscles actually a, a little bit apart and you feel like you've got a first trimester pregnancy all the time and a muffin top, then sometimes a standard tummy tuck is involved where we tighten the muscle, make a new belly button and remove the C-section scar and keep it very, very low down. And sometimes you've got fat off to the sides, the love handles in the flanks and you do an extended tummy tuck which usually includes liposuction on the sides and tightening of the muscle, making a new belly button and removing the muffin top and the C-section scar. Now, is that covered by OHIP? Unfortunately not, it just isn't. You'd have to have what's called a panis, which is massive amounts of weight and skin that hangs over and recurrent infections in your groin for OHIP to approve that now. So it is usually something you have to pay for. The good news is that there are finance companies now and they've been around, they're very reputable and they often finance cosmetic surgery procedures. So. You know, it was shocking to me when I looked at, at my patient um, um, database that uh, upwards of 50% of all patients finance their cosmetic surgery through these companies. And they'll, uh, they'll, they'll borrow the money and they'll pay it back $150 a month like a tar- car payment for 50, 60, 70 months until their tummy's paid for. But unlike your car, you get to keep your tummy forever and you don't have to <laughs> hand in the keys. And so companies like iFinance Canada have been doing this for over 20 years. And the vast majority of women, even with money, that choose to keep hanging on to the cash and just finance and pay for it, you know, $100, $150 a, a month. We're going to squeeze in one more question. Melissa's on the line. Hi, Melissa. You get the last word with Dr. Mo Holland. Awesome. Thank you. Good night. Uh, my mom, my mom and I, we are West Indian brown skin um, people, and she's suffering from age spots and dark spots on her skin. She wanted to know if there was any um, topical ointments or if there's any treatments via laser that you would recommend for that. 
you know, so there's um, light Caribbean dark skin and then dark Caribbean dark skin. And, uh, and if these lesions are not raised, sometimes they're raised dark bumps or they're flat dark bumps. But if you have relatively light dark brown skin, then you can use bleaching agents, usually prescribed by doctors that have hydroquinone mixed with retinoic acid, kojic acid, and do some salicylic type of peels and lighten the brown spots. Uh, and then there are some recent laser developments in the last two years uh, called picosecond lasers. And these lasers, pulse duration is so short. Uh, most, uh, let's say, lasers are in the millisecond range. These are in a trillionth of a second. They work through a photoacoustic effect. So it basically shatters your pigment and doesn't uh, need a thermal stimulation. So the risk of dark skin and lasers has always been hyperpigmentation or, or discoloration after the laser. These picosecond lasers allow dark skin individuals, whether it's an NBA basketball player wanting to get their tattoo removed or um, just um, your average everyday person with brown spots, uh, particularly in the cheeks and the, and the high cheekbones, um, to have them removed using these picosecond type lasers. Dr. Stephen Mulholland, thank you so much for this. Will you come back again soon? I'd love to. It's always fun to talk with you and with your listeners about cosmetic surgery. You are a smooth operator. You know that. Well, thank you. Now Sada. you have your theme song for when you return. I'm still in love with her. <laughs> She was something, wasn't she? Oh, we haven't she's heard like, from her in ages. What happened? She came out a new album about three, four years ago. It just wasn't quite like she put out in the uh, 80s. Okay. Dr. Stephen Mulholland, cosmetic plastic surgeon at Spa Medica. Thank you so much again. You've been listening to a segment from the best of the Night Side with Barb DiGiulio podcast. Log on, listen, and download the latest podcast right now by visiting Newstalk1010.com.